see that here. And we're going to just slide into our next presentation here. All right. You know, Julian and I have been very excited about coming here to Alaska. And it's almost three years now since uh, we've had an opportunity to, to be part of Alaska. I can consider myself really now as an Alaskan. Brave three winters and uh, still continue to, to um, enjoy this time being with God and working with, with all the churches and working with you throughout the conference. And one of the things that I just want to, to, to share, we have a major task, don't we, as, as a church throughout this conference. We have a big mission. And before we begin our presentation this morning, bow your heads with me. Gracious, loving Father, I ask you to pour your Holy Spirit right now. Help me to be able to share this uh, presentation in a way that will be easily understood and applicable for everyone. Thank you for hearing my prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of our presentation today is called uh, Harvest Cycle Discipleship, Unleashing the Power Through Discipleship. I'm going to do something here for a moment here. My screen right now is showing um, backwards. I'm not sure how to be able to flip this. Oh, it's not. Okay. Then the what's interesting here is that... Uh, you know, we are wanting to learn what it means to be a disciple of the Lord. And we're going to be talking about how to unleash the power of disciple making through uh, the power of this through disciple making. You know, we're, we're, we talk about crisis. We've been in a crisis. We still have many crises ahead. But you know that our church, we're talking about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, have also hit major crises. And we're in for a big crisis because of just reports and statistics that just came. Uh, churches today, they are, they said nine out of 10 churches are declining. And not only declining, they are, uh, they are dying, actually. And um, according to the research here, it says, Oh, let me see my slides here. Stop moving. Okay. Let's see what's going on here. My slide is not moving right now. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna pause for a moment because of technical difficulties. Okay, is it moving? There we go. There we go. Now, our churches need what you call CPR. When somebody gets a heart attack, we perform CPR just to be able to resuscitate them and to help them uh, be alive again. And it's interesting that our churches today are in great need of CPR. Now, according to the statement that's here on my screen, it says here that if the church has plateaued for more than 20 years, what is the chance of a successful revitalization? You know, according to this research that was taken by Ed Stetzer on comeback churches, you know what he noted? They, re, they uh, interviewed and surveyed 324 churches in 11 denominations. And according to his research, basically uh, only, only about 1.4% would survive on a, when the church is in a decline or a plateau. And all the others are between 0.7 and 1.4. The Southern Baptist was in 0.7. And the way for them to turn this around is if they would make transition to go through the process of rebuilding, which we'll be talking in a moment. Now, the key point they say is the pastors and leaders need to be willing to train well. And that includes all of us here. We need to see what can we do to turn our churches around to engage in leadership resources, to use outside consultants and trainers to assist them along the way. You know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm, when I hear about this information, I said, Lord, what will it take for us to be able to do this? Now, the North American division also did the same thing. 
they had a recent study that they reported in four certain areas, basically, whether it's declining, plateauing, growing, or multiplying. And they just used two categories, baptism and attendance. And pretty much we're so focused on how many people were baptized or how many people are coming to church. So this is the criteria the NAD used in their research. And if the church is declining, that means they have zero percent baptism and nobody's coming to church, or at least there's no new people coming to church. The ones that are plateauing is they're, they're at least up to 2% that are baptized, meaning if it's a hundred member church, they at least baptize two people. That's considered plateauing. When you see a plus two is at least up to 4%. Does that make sense so far? Notice in growing churches, they use up to the 4%. If the church at least baptized four people, that's considered a growing church according to their parameters or definition and attendance wise. Now multiplication, what they used here is basically if it's over 7% or equals to 7% growth. Now, the study that we, the NAD have discovered in 2019, look at this one right here. Declining in North American division is 58%, 19% plateauing, 23% growing, and multiplying only 23. Isn't that something? Look at the huge margin here for declining churches. And when you add the plateauing, that makes a huge difference. Notice North Pacific Union Conference. Look at the declining churches. How many churches are declining? 72% folks. Take a look at this one. This is just last uh, 2019 uh, report. Now, this is, is going to shock you. For Alaska, Alaska, when they did the research in 2019, it's showing 82% of our churches are, plateau are declining. In other words, for declining, it's what? Dying, right? Plateauing 9%, plateauing plus 2%, 6%. And then growing only just about 3%. That's a small sector. Do we have a crisis ahead for us? You better believe it. This is why it's high time for us to do something about to reverse this trend. How do we motivate disengaged members? You know, a lot of churches are into to trying to fix the problems in the church. They come up with different types of books how to increase the attendance, how to increase baptism, how to motivate members, and how to turn around dying churches or grow your church. There are dozens and dozens of books out there. They're trying to fix the problem. They're trying to fix the immediate problem. How do we turn this around? I know you're probably thinking the same thing in your church. Our church, you say, may be uh, a plateauing church or a dying church. How can we fix that? Now, what's interesting is this, friends, is that we need to be able to identify the problem properly. Because if we don't identify the problem properly, we're going to be in trouble because we're going to be stuck in a vicious cycle here. Now, keep in mind what often we do is we look at the surface effects of the problem. We see the top of this tree here or the main tree. What we don't look at are the major problems in the bottom. We look at the surface causes. Again, we just focus on this area right here. What we should be doing then is this. We should uh, see what are those problems? Well, again, visually, this is what most elders, pastors, members look at. Well, there's low attendance, low participation, apathy. Does that church have apathy? Distract, they're, they're distracted, there's worldliness, they're disengaged, they're too busy or they're too lazy or unfruitful, right? And so you can see the major problems. Well, when we see that problem, then we say, okay, we need to fix it. How do we fix it? Well, we find ways, okay, well, we need, we need to do a research how people join the church. Well, according to a recent uh, study done by Dr. Joe Kidder of Anders University, he found out that these are the ways people come and join the Seventh-day Adventist church. Look at this one right here. Brought up in an Adventist home, at least 59% of them will come to church. And then another one, a friend or a relative, or reading books, public evangel journals, and other material, public evangelism meetings, Bible studies in the home, visits by the pastor, television or radio programs, Bible correspondence course material on the internet, and others. Do you see the percentage right here? This is according to the research what he found. Now, 
So going back to this application here, if we see that the problem is the major on the surface, what we need to deal with is the root effects and problems. What are the root causes? Because if we don't deal with this, we'll continue to have the surface problems. And this is going to happen in any church. It doesn't matter what denomination, doesn't matter what, uh, what country, it, this is just a natural law here. Because what we need to remember, let's stop looking at the visible action and the surface causes. Now notice here, the surface cause, by the way, some of you are asking what that, that is, the attitudes. You know, sometimes we have people that come into church with certain types of attitudes. Well, that relates to visible actions, okay? Now, as we go down to the root problems, you will see that really deals with character. That's character of people that come to church, amen? Uh, by the way, I know you, you're all muted, but you can wave your hand and say amen. That's the way you can say amen, right? Now. The, the, let's go down a little deeper to the root causes where we say we see here is wrong response to God's word. A wrong response. Well, you say, Pastor, that's what do you mean by this? Let's go a little bit uh, deeper here now. Now, notice here, from this setup here, what we do here as we, most of the time, generally, uh, people, we focus on just the surface problems and surface costs. So what do we do? We change the behavior. And this is what we call behavior modification, right? We say, well, if you change that behavior, you're going to fix the problem. But friends, again, we're just dealing with the surface issues here. What we need to be able to do is this. Uh, we need to be able to go beyond that because if we're dealing with just the visible part, for example, not only 5% of the people in church are wanting to do soul winning or evangelism. Well, People are saying, logically, then we need to have more people doing witnessing and evangelizing, okay? And what, what you, you're realizing the surface cause is, sometimes it, it's, it's our fault as leaders. We create guilt. You know what? If you don't, if you don't help them, they're going to be lost. Or saying, you know what? As a Christian, every Christian should reach the lost for Jesus Christ, right? And so we, we say out of duty, you need to do this, or we appeal to their emotions. Again, all of this here is just dealing with surface causes. You're not going to be able to get much. Now, if you go down to the root situation, this is when you find out the character is, well, people don't have love for, they didn't have love for people or for the lost. And you know, there are actually people that do not love other people. They hate to be with other people. And when we're in the soul winning business, we can't, it's going to be very difficult to not love people, right? So while well, we say, well, how do we fix that? Easy, this. The root cause is basically there's no heart for, of Christ or there's no love of Christ. When you have the love of Jesus in you, you will love people just like the way Jesus loved people too. Amen? Wave your hand. Amen? That's the way Jesus is. He loves people. I said, okay, pastor, come on, teach me some more. Well, it's basically our wrong response to God's word here. We're not responding it in a proper way. Now, help me out some more. When we go to Acts 1.8, this is a beautiful passage, right? When you see this passage right here, you can see it on your screen. What is the very first thing that we usually focus on? You know what that is? I'll tell you, because I know I've done this myself. We focus on this word, power. We want power. We want to be able to have the power to, to go forward, right? Folks, again, let me tell you this. There, that is not where we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on this, but you shall receive power. What we should be focusing is on this one but we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit, okay? When the Holy Spirit has come upon what? You and me. That is the focus. That is the root major cause here. When you have the Holy Spirit, he gives you not only the power, he gives you the transformation. He's the one that does the thing here for us. Notice when you have the Holy Spirit, Look at the next line here. And you shall do witnessing? No, he doesn't say that. You shall be witnesses. You see what happens? The Holy Spirit transforms us. It's not necessarily 
the action that you focus on is the being. How do you become a witness? Well, I need to be spirit filled. Amen. I need to be spirit filled. I need to be uh, anointed by the Holy Spirit. But when you do that, when you focus on that, all of this witnessing in whatever it may be, the Holy Spirit will bless you and give you success. Amen. The parable of the sower, this is a powerful parable. You can find them in the four gospels. And, and you know what's interesting in the parable of the sower where we focus on? We focus on the soil. We say, well, that's really the different types of hearers and interests. So we have the hard soil, the stony soil, the thorny and the fertile soil. We focus on the soil, but friends, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be focusing on uh, not on the soil, but we should be focusing on something else. The sower, okay? We, yes, you might have read it in scriptures, you might have been read it in Christ object lessons, but really take a look. We should be focusing on the sower. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, that's why they call it the parable of the sower, okay? Not the soil, not the parable of the soil. Now, what's interesting is this if you are a pop, uh, farmer, or a sower, <laughs> it's common sense you're not going to sow on hard soil. You're not going to sow on stony or thorny soil. You're going to sow on the most fertile area, right? That's what you want to do. And according to, to a research, and I'm going to uh, share this with you in a moment here, is uh, research done by, let me see if I can put it, disciple making study by discipleship.org exponential and gray matter research it was done just last year, okay? They noted five levels, okay? Five levels right here. Re remember this five levels because it's crucial here. Number one, level one is declining churches. That means we're subtracting in the kingdom of God. Our church is not growing. Number two, plateauing, plateauing. That means yeah, I gave you the definition, but it's just status quo. There's nothing going on here. Number three, level three, growing churches. We're just adding. This is where we're just adding baptism here, baptism there. Now, level four, reproducing churches and disciple making, okay? And then level five, multiplying churches, disciple making. Oh, when I saw this, I got excited. You know why? Because this is the kind of foundation we're laying right here. Now, in Alaska, our kingdom growth, now, remember, I gave you the bad news a few minutes ago, but let me tell you some good news. You like to hear it? Okay, here you go. In 2018, 2018, we baptized 42 people. We praise the Lord for that. But look at the trend in 2019, 58 in 2020, 19, I mean, 99 people were baptized. I said, hallelujah, right? You see the trend going on? The next, in terms of profession of faith, you see from 6, 11 to 13, there's a steady increase there. But this is the part that got me really excited. You see this? The percentage, the first one is only 0 0.13, 0 0.13, folks. That's pretty small, you'd say. Well, at least it's in the positive. But the following year, actually, this should be a negative. It's a minus 3.31, okay? I, I made a mistake on that one. That's a minus 3.31. Why? Because some of our churches are have added to their books. They got rid of people that should not be in the membership book. And don't be afraid of doing that, okay? To get an actual count in your kingdom grow. So this is a minus. Now, on, on 2020, we have 1.84%. 1.84%, amen? Now, compared to, what is it? Compared to, uh, by the way, compared to the North American division, notice a trend from 2012 to 2017, 1.77, it keeps going down to 1.42 until finally 2017, it's 1.03, where our last conference is 1.84. Amen? Somebody ought to say amen, right? We praise the Lord for that because something is going on. Something is taking place. See, when we have crisis, crisis can actually be an opportunity, right? An opportunity to turn things around and lay the foundation and where we can have opportunity to even expand God's kingdom. Now, going back to this five levels right here, I want you to know 
Alaska conference is just on level three for now. Again, we're just rebuilding the foundation. That's why when when uh, when Julian and I go to your church and hold a discipleship uh, uh, discipleship master plan training, what we're doing is we're trying to lay foundation here to change the mindset and and the the the. Uh, the trajectory trajectory of the church. So we're just right now in addition. What we want to do is be able to focus on level four and eventually level five. Okay, and so this is where our goal is. Now, what's also noted here? Oh, I went too fast. There's only about five percent of the churches in the United States. We're talking about all Christian Protestant churches that in the US that have reproducing disciple making culture, that's L4, okay? Now an absence of the churches reflecting viral disciple making movements, uh, that's nothing. Nobody yet has reached level five. According to their studies, at least from what they have reported, there's none in the United States. In other countries, yes, okay? And now what do you mean by this? I'll explain that in a few moments. Now, according to this passage, it says here, pastors, leaders must embrace disciple making as the core mission, the core mission of the local church. So this is where we need to be able to change our thinking and our pattern. And according to the research, what happens? A reality check, they're finding out that pastors spend about 32% of the time uh, on their sermon prep and 20% on pastoral care. Now, 20% of administration and only 9%, 9% of the average of the pastor he spends in equipping people to be disciple makers, okay? That's what they found out, only 9%. What is it like in your church, okay? Now, as a farmer here, I like this photo right here because this farmer, notice, notice his, he's showing his, his uh, little harvest in a basket here, but look at the, the field, acres and acres of, of uh, produce, vegetables. Oh, I would love to be a, to have a backyard like that, won't you? And, um, and so keep in mind, a farmer, a farmer intends when he prepares the land in area, when he, when he plants, he expects at least 30 fold, 60 fold, or 100 fold, just like in scriptures, like, just like in the, um, the peril of the sower. Jesus said in this parable, you know, sow on the good soil. Well, this is why we're talking about the harvest uh, cycle of discipleship right here. No farmer would want to, to, to invest his time, money, and energy in planting in, in places that it's going to yield 1%, 5%. You got to be kidding me. We don't want to do that. It's a waste of time. God doesn't want you to do that too because it's a waste of, of, of uh, his funds here and it's not proper stewardship so going back to our our five levels of discipleship you can see we want to focus on how then do we reproduce churches and disciple making churches how do we do that now let me continue to break it down because once you focus on level four eventually your church will be able to experience multiplying churches by the way the book of acts talks about this right here the book of acts is a perfect example of level five, okay? That's very scriptural. And so when they started fear level four and then became level five. Now, this is what's very interesting about this. Notice in level four disciple making, level four is basically reproducing disciples. When this happens, you have at least 24 to 50% of lay leaders, that's you, okay? What is that, becoming disciple, makers okay see the word not just a disciple a disciple maker that's what you need to be able to focus on when you have your our church 24 to 50 percent are engaged in disciple making disciple makers that's what happens it becomes exciting and you can experience multiple growth now on level five when multiplying disciples by almost everyone what is the percentage 90 percent 90% becoming disciple makers. That's what happened in the book of Acts. That's why it exploded. And you know what we're told in, in scriptures and spirit prophecy too? This is what's gonna happen just before Jesus comes. You believe that? I believe it, amen? 
You believe it? Wave your hand, wave your hand. I can see you, I can see you on the screen here, okay? Now, are you a member or a disciple, friends? Elders, leaders, you're watching this. Are you a member or a disciple? And, and I hope you say, I wanna be a disciple. How do we do that? That's what we're talking about here, okay? Now, they are basically three dimensions, they say, of multiplication. Now remember, that's level four, level five. Disciple making, number one. Number two, the capacity building for disciple making. This is what we're, when we have an opportunity, I'm just giving you the overview this morning, okay? We don't have that much time. What is that capacity? That's why when we talk about the advanced discipleship training, you're gonna be so excited about that. The number three, mobilization for disciple making. When these three dimensions align, we get biblical disciples who make biblical disciples who plant churches that plant churches. Did you get that? Let me repeat that because this is important. When this three line up or line up right there, when a church focuses on this three major item, we get biblical disciples who make biblical disciples, okay, who plant churches that plant churches. <laughs> That's why it's going to be exciting. You know what? Oh, I had, I had a, just an opportunity to experience just a, a little tidbit of that uh, before coming here to Alaska when I was in, in, in Nashville. Now, uh, when I was, if you've been in one of the presentation I shared, I share about this Gospel Commission 3. Uh, it, this is a really powerful illustration right here. The roots represent Christ. The trunk represents discipleship. This is based on Matthew 28, 19 and 20. The branches, notice, is Sabbath school, evangelism, youth ministry, worship, Christian education, and all the others. What happened here is this, folks. We have focused mainly on the branches and not on the trunk, okay? We've made a huge ministry out of all these, these branches right here. Now, oh, let me backtrack for a moment here. This is only the method, the branch of the method where the goal is calling people into a relationship with Jesus, calling people to, to fellowship with, uh, with each other. So look at all this leadership, I mean, with this uh, spiritual gifts. This spiritual gifts represent the branches in the tree, okay? That's not the main focus. These are just the methods, how we go about this. So all of this here are important. That's why we can't just emphasize one gift more than the other. They're all important according to God's, God's eyes. As without, remember, the Holy Spirit is the one that gives you the gifts, okay? And by the way, the more you use them, the more it multiplies, okay? Now, the trunk is a disciple is discipleship. Discipleship, remember, is not a spiritual gift. What is it? It's a calling. You are all called to a relationship to be a disciple and disciplers for Christ. You know, question I ask you now, are you a disciple or a disciple maker? You know, we first have to be a disciple first in Jesus Christ, and then he trains us to become disciple makers. According to what Jesus wants, he wants us to be both, okay? He wants us to continue to be a disciple. You don't graduate being a disciple. You'll continue to be a disciple of Jesus uh, for eternity because we want to learn more about Jesus, right? Amen? And then we want to become disciple makers. Now, here's a reality check. Disciple making encompasses far more building relationship with people in order to make disciples, conversation, traditional discipleship and multiplication. Now, how this, subs how this uh, substantial difference impacts things will depend, notice, on how pastors or leaders think about discipleship and disciple making. I can tell you, I can tell you off to him, if, if your pastor or leader, or elders and leaders in the church have small, you know, discipleship is not a major focus, I'm gonna tell you what, the trajectory of the church that you're at going to be for the next five to 10 years, okay? Because we're not following the scriptural foundation Jesus gave us. Now, how do people join the church? Again, this is what Joe Kidder found out in the Adventist church. 59% are brought up in the Adventist home. So folks, do you have family members who do not know Jesus Christ? Start right there, 
do not forget them and, and go after your neighbor or a friend. Go start with uh, your son, your daughter who do not know Jesus Christ, your husband or your wife who do not know Jesus Christ, your relative who do not know Jesus Christ. Start right there, okay? That's when you can focus on already discipling. How do you do that? We'll talk, we eventually we'll talk more about through the year how you can reach out uh, these with these people. Notice the second thing, a friend or relative. 58%. It's interesting that this is the highest, actually, in some research, it goes even as high to 65 to 75%. Okay. So all of these are important, but I want to focus on these top area here. Look at this. This Avenue study is consistent with similar research in other Christian settings. Most people come to the Lord through the influence of web relationship. When, we're not talking about just the internet web, okay? We're talking about your, your network of relationship and friendship. Absolutely, the most effective way of reaching people for the gospel is through your personal influence. Friends, that's why God saved you and brought you and gave you grace and gave you salvation. So not only that we can get to heaven, but we can reach out to our family and network for his kingdom. Amen? Now, as we continue here, so basically the harvest cycle, according to the uh, farmer or the sower, will think in this process, well, I need to cultivate, I need to sow, I need to grow, I need to reap, and I need to preserve. Okay, he thinks of that this is one of his natural processes. Again, he goes about this knowing he expects things. So when he cultivates, he's getting rid of all the hard soil, all the rocks, all the weeds, okay? When he sows, he wants to make sure that seed goes in, in the ground, in the soil. So it will germinate, right? Why? Because he expects it to grow. A farmer doesn't plant seeds and doesn't expect, he said, well, if it grows 50-50, I don't know. No, no, no. The, the farmer knows the natural laws. Likewise, we have spiritual laws too when you follow what Jesus gave us. And therefore, you will see and see find harvest here. So level four, let's continue with level four. Cultivate then, receiving the fruit of the spirit. That's the first thing. Cultivate that. What do you mean, pastor? Well, what, are the, what is the fruit of the spirit? You know this, right? It's the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. By the way, this is good to memorize, okay? This will be good to memorize. This is what is expected of us, to have the fruit of the spirit. You want the character of Jesus? You need the fruit of the spirit. That's simple as that. And so how do you receive the fruit of the spirit, friends? If you were all here, I would ask you to, to, to say, well, what is the answer? How do you receive it? Through the Holy Spirit. Do you have to earn it? No, you don't have to earn it. You just have to ask, right? Lord, give me the Holy Spirit. Give me the fruit of the Spirit. He will give you that, okay? Now, according to John, chapter 15, my one of my favorite chapters and favorite books in scriptures, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who what? Abides in me and I in him bears, what friends? Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Oh, we've read this many times, but it just keeps through us. We forget about the importance of this. Right here, folks, you want to know the foundation of uh, the harvest uh, cycle of discipleship? Right here. Abide in Jesus. Abide in Christ. If you are not abiding in Christ every day, you're not going to grow. Amen? Right? You need to abide with Jesus, and you need to abide with him. According to this passage, you don't have to worry about fruits. You know why? It's just going to happen. Does an apple have to think and concentrate? Oh, I got to bear apples. I got to bear more apples. I got to bear more apples. Oh, I got to bear apples. He doesn't force himself to, to bear apples. It comes what? Naturally, right? As long as the apple tree is getting water, nutrients, and the sunshine, it will just bear fruit. Why? It's in the DNA, right? Of that tree to bear fruits. Likewise, Jesus said, here's the proper DNA. Abide in Jesus. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you the fruit of the Spirit and more, and you're going to bear fruit. Is this making sense so far? Wave your hand, friends. Wave your hand. 
is this making sense? Praise the Lord. By the way, be sure to type in too if it's making sense. We'll have comments in there. Now, level four is solve. Solve for yourselves. This is in Hosea 10, 12. I love this. Solve for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to what? Time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness upon you. Right here, folks, scriptures gives us the, the principles for harvest cycle of deception. You're sowing righteousness. What is that really talking about? That's talking about character. Notice here in, in I love the NIV, NLT, I mean, version. I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of what? Love, plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. So what is that right? What is this growing? It's growing our character, folks. That's it. It's growing our character. That's why you can see, remember we talked about that surface and, and uh, problems and, and root problems? Jesus style disciple making is the core mission of the church. It is motivated by what? Love for people. People lost without salvation. That's why when you continue to abide in Jesus, you know, you're, you're going to ache for the loss. You're going to be hungry for the loss. And the church, notice here, regularly reproduces disciples and disciple makers. You see, disciple making is the emerging cultural uh, cultural identity of the church. This is what we want Alaska Conference in a way to see all our churches to be a disciple making church reflected in the reproduction of the church's values, actions, and words. You agree? You agree to that? I said, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you. So the next one, the next one is grow the gifts of the spirit by using them. Okay, that's part of the harvest cycle of discipleship. And you can see the gifts here as we showed it before. You need to utilize them because the more you use them and utilize them by faith, God will increase them, right? How do you receive the gifts of the Spirit? Again, through the Holy Spirit. Notice that's how you receive it. Simple as that. Level four. So grow in love with Jesus. Grow in the Spirit. Grow in character. Use your gifts that God has given you. And now focus on mentoring and coaching and discipling others. Okay? That's what we have to do, friends. That's what we need to be doing, focusing and discipling others. Now, another portion of level four. Remember, this is where we want to see uh, become a reality in our, in our churches. Every decision made. Look at this one, folks. Look at the screen. Every decision made and every dollar spent passes through the filter. How does this help us make disciples in relational environments like Jesus? Shouldn't that, shouldn't that way we look at things? Unfortunately, we, we have our budgets reversed in different things. And uh, you know you know the saying, where your money is, there is your heart. Or where your heart is, that's where your money is too. Likewise, you, you focus on things that you're really interested in. And in, in churches, this is where we need to be focusing on. The church has a starting foundation of weekly. Notice, do you see this, friends? Weekly fasting and praying, asking for God to empower disciple making. Amen? That's what we need to be praying for. Uh, the church, praying and fasting. Folks, there's no shortcut. If, you, if we don't pray, we're not going to grow. We need to have churches. I would love to see um, many churches, all the churches, if possible, in Alaska Conference, having a prayer team that spends time in praying and fasting every week, once a week at least. You agree? Do you agree? You can't just say, uh, just pray here and there or, or uh, by yourself. We need to do this also collectively. Use the phone system, use a Zoom system, do something. This is why, in a way, I would, I would say with all this crisis with COVID-19, utilize the situation to reset your church to be able to, to follow the right, to, or to have the right foundation. Look at the next thing in level four about reaping. The core discipleship leadership focused not just on 
making disciples, but on making disciple makers, okay? With at least notice 20 to 39% of the time spent personally equipping. So this is where it's gotta increase. This is where really it's at. Even, okay, I'm talking about outside even the Adventist church culture, the other Christians are saying, hey, this is what we need to do. This is what the Bible is talking about. Folks, you know what? This is where we should be really ahead in doing this, right? There's a joyful expectation that every disciple should obey all of Jesus' teachings. Is that true? Yes? You better believe it. When we bring somebody into the church, we want them to be a follower of Jesus, committed to Jesus Christ, obedient to the words of Christ, right? And grow to become a disciple maker. I said, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We want that. We need that, don't we? Now, which comes first, friends? The fruit or the gift of the Spirit? I want you to do this on the screen. You put up one hand, the fruit, or two, the gift. Which do you think comes first? One or two? Oh, I see two. I see ones. Oh, some of you don't. Come on, you, you can't. You're not being graded on this. Either one or two. Which comes first, the fruit or the gift? I'll tell you what comes first, okay? Uh, based on scriptures, the one comes first. Remember in Matthew 25, when we're talking about uh, the parable of the ten virgins, that's dealing with the character, the fruits. Then it talks about the parable of the talents, the gifts of the spirit, okay? So we need to have the fruit first because that's developing our character. Once our character is being developed, the fruits, the gifts will come out here, okay? Look at this one. In level four, how to preserve, that means 24 to 50% or more of adult lay leaders are, notice what does it say? Personally engaged in leading roles and reproducing disciples. Every leader using the same simple, effective, and reproducible disciple-making model. We like this to be so simple, friends, in a way that uh, we want it to be where you can follow it and say, oh, I get it, I understand it. And, and we want to make resources available for you. Notice, reproducible disciple-making model and a metric that tracks effectiveness Disciple application of the same model. I said, praise God. Okay. Now, the core, the core leadership focus, not just on making disciples, but on notice, making disciple makers of a lay leaders with at least 20 to 29, 39% of their time spent. Okay. And there's joyful expectation. Now, the core leaders of the stories, they hear many stories. And I'm going to tell you, what's going on pretty soon on other churches that are, that are experiencing this. Uh, their activities, they're planning new churches every year or two. So putting it together here, you can see here, the fruit of the spirit and cultivate and sow character, grow, give to the spirit, reap, making disciples and preserve making disciples who make other disciples. Okay, uh, just for our sake of our time, I'm going to, by the way, if you notice, this is now for the harvest cycle for interest. These are some of the things we'll, they, we get to do. We, that's just going to be a quick overview. On another time, I'll talk about this. I just want to tell you a little, little a story. Well, you see the ref, uh, receptivity scale here. Sometimes we say, how can we get people from negative five so they can accept Christ? You know what? We come up with so many creative ideas, but I want to tell you what, that's not your job, okay? That's not your job to, from getting them to be antagonist or assistant. Your job is just to, to let the Holy Spirit lead you to make that difference in people's lives. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to open people's heart, to nudge them towards Christ. You're just that can do it, the channel God used to make a difference in people. Uh, let, me, let me close with this. Um, passage in, in um, Christ Object Lesson, the sower of the seed have a work to do in preparing hearts to receive the gospel in the ministry of the word. There's too much sermonizing. You know what? We preach too much. That's true. Uh, 
and too little heart-to-heart -heart work. There's need of personal labor for the souls of the lost. In Christ-like sympathy, we should come close to men individually and seek to awaken their interest in the great things of God. You know what? Isn't that true? We need to do that. We need to do that. Folks, this is just a quick, simple overview of what a high harvest cycle of discipleship is about. I've seen people change because uh, they have given their lives to God and being a disciple. And I'm just going to close with just this story of this couple right here. This is uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew and Gracie. They're young adults in Nashville. They moved from Atlanta. When they first came to Nashville, they were looking for jo great jobs and to make a difference for God's kingdom. And, you know, it's interesting that uh, they didn't, they hopped around the churches and finally they found a church. They said, oh my, we want to be, we want to be part of this church. We want to be part of a spirit-filled church and, and God used you to utilize them. You know what they want? They said we were, they were given an opportunity where where they became eventually uh, disciples and eventually disciple makers. Uh, they were willing to leave their family at Atlanta to stay in Nashville to grow God's kingdom. You can see the difference that that's made in their lives. Gracie is a is a CPA. She was willing to to come to the point in her life where she's saying she's saying, Lord, I want to give more time to you. So what, how can I do that? You know what she did? She kept praying that, Lord, how can I be a disciple maker? And so with that prayer, she lost her job. But you know what? Trusting God, knowing discipleship principles, she knew God is going to provide. And you know what happened? Make a long story short, God gave her a better job where she can work from home. She had more time to give Bible studies and disciple other people. Amen. In fact, not only that, just a sideline, the people who gave her uh, the job that said, how much money do you want to make? Both of them lost their jobs. And yet the employer said, how much money do you want to make for God's, okay? How much money do you want? You see, when you trust God, God will continue to provide. Amen. Pray with me. Loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to talk about what it means to be a disciple maker for your kingdom. Lord, we pray and take this moment to ask you, would you help us? We heard for the last 40, 50 minutes what it means to be a disciple and disciple maker and how to make a difference for your kingdom. Lord, we want to turn the situation around in our churches. We want you to turn around and bring about a, a revitalization or renewal in our spiritual lives. How many of you, if you're watching this or you're watching the recording eventually later on, how many of you would like to say to Lord, Lord Jesus, please, truly, I'm giving it all to you. Help me to be a committed disciple, discipler, disciple maker for your kingdom. Do what it takes. Pour your Holy Spirit upon me. Would you raise your hand? Wave your hand right now. Let everybody know that you want to make this decision for Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We want that. We want that to happen in our lives. Thank you for hearing our prayers. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. We pray. Amen. God bless you. Take good care. Thank you, Pastor Santos. We're certainly uh, privileged that uh, you had an opportunity.